My thing has always been hidden jewels. I do like the great attractions and sites that have been made famous due to years of travelers admiring them. You can't go to India without seeing the Taj Mahal or doing a tiger safari. But it's the off the beaten path places that inspire the greatest excitement, especially if those out of the way places have a great story to tell. One of those is the city of Ahmedabad. The name doesn't ring a bell? Well, for most it wouldn't. Yet it is where one of the greatest revolutionary philosophies reached its zenith. It was the headquarters of a man whose teaching would inspire the American Civil Rights Movement, the end of apartheid in South Africa, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it would get independence for the largest member of the British Empire. Ahmedabad, it's the land of Gandhi. Namaste, I'm Bill Ball, and I'm going to be your guide on this episode of Journeys in India. And this is India. Well, welcome to Ahmedabad. What, what, you haven't heard of Ahmedabad? Well, then you're in for a surprise. And for those of you that have heard of it, I think we've got some surprises for you too. Ahmedabad is located in the state of Gujarat in the far west of India. Surrounded by near desert conditions, this is an unlikely place for the center of a revolutionary movement. You would think a big city like Delhi or Mumbai or the more wealthy south would be a more likely epicenter for change. For the tourist, Ahmedabad has a number of nearby attractions, like the Birders Paradise, Saravar Reserve, or the big game lovers Black Buck Sanctuary. This area is worth several days of exploring on its own. Add to that other Gujarat attractions like Gur National Park and the Ran of Kutch, and you have one busy travel experience. In the center of it all, though, is the city of Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad has a population of four million. It is a diverse city, and much more than that than just for Gandhi. The architecture can stand on its own. The architectural heavyweight for the city is a very special building style called a Havali. A Havali, simply put, is a 150 to 200 year old carved house found primarily in Gujarat. Some of the best examples of these once high-class homes is here in Ahmedabad. One Havali characteristic is its open central courtyard, which is designed to let in optimal light and air. This is particularly important in the heat of Gujarat, which can reach 110 degrees in the shade. The term Havali is derived from the Arabic, meaning a private space. The term evolved to mean a mansion throughout the Indian subcontinent, but was further refined in Gujarat to mean a mansion that exhibited fine carving on its exterior and was made primarily of wood. These homes are based on an ancient Hindu architectural system called Vastu Shastra, or literally, the science of architecture. These ancient texts describe the principles of design and layout. It is based on integrating nature and architecture sort of a South Asian feng shui. Since they are wooden structures dating back nearly two centuries, many have been lost. Those remaining have been designated historic treasures and the exteriors must be preserved. New owners are restoring and converting them into boutique hotels, shopping complexes, and museums. The Havali has its roots in temple architecture and palace design. So it is no surprise the original owners were the wealthy, often members of the high caste system of the Brahmins. Today the owners are also wealthy, but the merchant class has replaced the inherited caste system. One of the major items sold in the Havali stores in Ahmedabad are textiles, which is one of the ancient art forms the city is famous for. One of the places to see the best of ancient textiles is here at the Calico Museum. This is the best collection of textiles in all of India and one of the most renowned in the world. As such, it has some expected rules. No photography, no touching the fabrics, and a limited number of guests at a time. It also has some unusual rules. Admittance is only by guided tour, 
and only 20 guests, one tour a day at precisely 10.30, and it lasts two hours. There are a number of steps up and down in the museum complex, so visitors should be aware. For this appointment only limited access, the reward is free admittance to the collection of textiles spanning five centuries. The museum was founded in 1949 by the Sherib High family. The focus would be on handicraft textiles as opposed to industrial ones. The museum was to serve as an inspiration and history for handicraft textile artisans and scholars. The collection is massive and only a fraction is on display. Ahmadabad was chosen as the location for this important museum since it had been the trade center for textiles since the 15th century. The museum has increased its reach through an extensive publication program. The publications have a two-point approach. One, surveying the historic fabrics of India and the other, the contemporary craft textiles of the country. Calico Mills of Ahmadabad had been the early sponsor and funding source for this museum. But with the company hitting financial problems in 1982, the museum went fully independent and remains so to this day. It is now housed in the Sarabhai Foundation premises in a hovely and a complex of outbuildings. This is an incredible collection, and though advanced planning and reservations are needed, it is well worth the effort. The connection between the city's textile industry and trading status and Mohatma Gandhi is not that far-fetched. Gandhi advocated everyone working a spinning wheel for self-sufficiency and inner calm. He did just that in his ashram headquarters near Ahmadabad. Gandhi's ashram is four miles from Ahmadabad along the banks of the Sebar Mahdi River. Gandhi lived here with his wife for about 12 years. It was from here that Gandhi led the famous Salt March in 1930 that was a major impetus to Indian independence. A little Gandhi history lesson is probably in order before jumping into the ashram and the closing chapters of his life. Gandhi was born in Porbandar in the British India, now a state of Gujarat, on October 2, 1869. His father served as the prime minister for the small kingdom, as did his father's father. That didn't make them wealthy, but they were well off, enough so that they could afford to send young Gandhi off to law school in London. He received his degree and came back to India to practice. He failed miserably as a trial lawyer in India. His older brother figured that he needed to focus on a less dynamic side of law, so he recommended a change in venue. Mahatma shipped off to South Africa to assist an Indian company in a lawsuit. The situation in South Africa stirred his soul more than he could ever have imagined. The Indian community was being blatantly discriminated against. They did not have voting rights, equal protection under the law, and the white minority even controlled their jobs. This is where Gandhi started his nonviolence movement. He fought for the personal freedoms of his fellow Indians as well as economic fairness. He was living and working out of Durban when he launched his attack. Here, he devised the non-violence method used to help the colors, the apartheid era name for anyone not white or African. When he moved back to India years later, he was already a celebrity. He chose to live simply to put the focus on the work, not himself. His non-violence approach was copied and modified in all parts of the world, including or should I say especially, by Martin Luther King Jr. I had a chance to interview a number of King's associates and all of them said that King had Gandhi's books handy at all times. That brings us to 1930 and the Salt March. The British had imposed a tax on the most basic of all products, salt. To dramatize how ludicrous it was, Gandhi led a peaceful 250 mile march to the sea. Upon reaching the sea, Gandhi went about making his own salt in defiance of the British. Gandhi lived here at the ashram at that pivotal time in Indian history. This ashram was established in 1917 on 36 acres to allow for farming. 
This may have been the site of an ancient ashram of Dadhichi Rishi, a god in Hindu mythology that died so his bones could be used as weapons by the righteous gods against evil. This connection was likely not a coincidence. The ashram also had a jail on one side and a crematorium on the other. Gandhi felt that too was appropriate because his freedom fight would lead to one or the other. The first site for visitors to the ashram is the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil monkeys. Gandhi valued truth as the only way to justice. He transformed himself from a suit lawyer to a man with the simplest tastes to exemplify and identify with the average person. Today the ashram is a memorial to the man and his philosophy and its impact on the world. Though his primary aim once he returned to India was fairness and independence for his country, his ideas resonated around the world. Visitors can step into his room and get a sense of the man behind the myth. Often stories about a legend's origins or lifestyle are just that, legends. But here, you can experience firsthand the life the man led. Still an active center for peace, the ashram continues in the tradition of its founder. It is free to visit, and the staff are more than happy to help you learn about and discover Gandhi for yourself. Though Gandhi was a Hindu, he was an advocate for religious freedom. He wanted a combined India for Hindu and Muslim alike. Under the British, the Indian Empire was won. But once independence came, political rivalries tore it apart, creating Pakistan, Bangladesh, then Eastern Pakistan, and India. Today, the once united countries have tense relations where some predict World War III may start. It was Gandhi's hard work to unite the two religions under one country's banner that got him killed. A fanatical Hindu assassinated him just as his dream of an independent India was being realized. Gujarat is bordered by Pakistan, so it is no wonder that there is a sizable Muslim population in Ahmedabad. One of the architecturally significant buildings is indeed a mosque. One of the most striking features of the mosque is the carved screen. This stone carving is not typical of mosques since many do not allow any portrayals of people, animals, or plants. Like most mosques, there are five calls to prayer a day. Though few make it to all five, most faithful do attend at least one and in the other times, stop what they're doing and pray. Remember, when visiting a mosque, ask permission to enter. Not all mosques are open to outsiders. Also, remove your shoes before entering and dress modestly. No exposed shoulders or knees, and women should wear a headscarf. It is their beliefs and place of worship, so good manners dictates following the rules. Across the street from the mosque is one of the destination hotels that add another reason to visit the city. This one is named for a favorite son of the city. No, not Mahatma Gandhi, but rather Mangalis Gerhardis, a local businessman. The hotel is called the House of MG and is based in one of the restored buildings in the historic district. The House of MG is right at the edge of the old town and the craziness of the market, but it's really an oasis of calm and quiet. That's why I'm going in. The House of MG was built in 1924 as the home of a wealthy textile magnate. Listed as an urban heritage hotel, it has been restored with an historic context in mind. A boutique hotel, it has only 38 rooms. Originally, it was the home of the Mangalis and his brother. Mangalis started his career as a storekeeper in a textile mill. Within a decade, the brothers owned the mill and expanded into many other businesses in Ahmedabad. They built this mansion as a family compound. Over the years, the family members moved to their own homes in new parts of the town, 
and this building became the accounting office. By the mid-1900s, it was being rented out and held the country's first department store. Soon, it was totally abandoned. But in 1994, some members of the family saved the former family estate and turned it into a heritage hotel. It opened as such in 2007. Architecturally, it is a mix of Baroque and ornamental styles with Italianate mosaics and marble flooring. It is stained glass windows and a typical hovely swing. It is truly an Ahmadabad experience. After a good night's sleep, it was time to venture out of the city center to the most unusual site, the Ad Alaj Stepwell. This unique Hindu well was built in 1499 by the Muslim king, Mohammed Begda, finishing what had been started by the Hindu king he had just conquered and killed. The step wells were a common way for storing precious rainwater in the Gujarat desert. Some go back as early as the third century BC. The earliest wells were stone, with later ones being made of mortar and stucco. By the 11th century, the well technology was perfected, with the builders taking the soil conditions and earthquake potential of the region into account. This particular well has a tragic legend linked to it. The well was begun by the Hindu king Rana Veer Singh, who was attacked and killed by Begda before he could finish the well. His queen, Rana Rukba, grieving over her husband's murder, agreed to marry the conqueror, who was smitten by her beauty, on the condition he finished the well. He agreed and completed the water tank in record time. Rather than betray her husband and his memory, Rana then jumped into the now finished water tank, denying her husband's killer his prize. Begda decided the beauty of the well was too great to destroy and the tale was inscribed on the walls. In an adjacent legend, Begda asked local architects if they could build another one. The few that said it was possible were executed, so no other one could ever exist. Just 11 miles outside of Ahmadabad, this five-story deep well has steps that take visitors deep into its artistic core. There is a nominal fee to enter this structure. Back in Ahmadabad, it was time to explore the city proper, and there is no better place to start than the city market. One of the most common items in the Ahmadabad market is clothing. Not the great handicraft textiles of the Calico Museum fame, but the city's connection to cloth is unmistakable. Of course, the market covers just about anything you might want to buy, from computers to flowers to jewelry and more. One of the best parts of any market, though, is the energy. Energy of the buyers, the sellers, and the market itself. This bazaar has an architectural feature that also is significant, which, like the cloth, is a feature of the city. In this case, it's the Badra Gate. This is one of 21 original gates acting as an entrance into the walled city of Ahmadabad. Construction on the gate started in 1411. The Badri Fort had eight of these gates, one of which, near the market, was built in 1874. Like many of the surviving gates, it is well carved with stunning architectural features. Ahmadabad city is more than Gandhi or cloth. It is a destination in its own right. Well, there's no better place to begin than when the old town meets the new town. And that just happens to be where Gujarat's favorite son used to live. The old port of Ahmadabad includes the market and the city gates, but it also includes many residential neighborhoods and commercial sections. The collection of multi-era buildings makes Ahmadabad a living architectural museum. One of the banner carriers for this is the campus of the National Institute of Design. 
the 400 or so students study all aspects of design, from furniture to film and video to graphics, and because it's a Madabad, textiles. Fittingly, its cutting edge curriculum caused Business Week to rank it as one of the top design schools in the world. Ahmadabad is growing rapidly and the modern world is coming along full steam and yet history is never forgotten. That is what makes this city so alive to its residents and visitors. Archaeological ruins, a bird sanctuary, Gandhi's ashram, and of course the wild old town. Ahmadabad seems to have it all. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. The city is most famous for its association with its favorite son, Mahatma Gandhi. He lived in the ashram here in Ahmadabad as he planned his most famous nonviolent civil disobedience, the Salt March. Visitors can walk in his footsteps and learn not only about the legend, but also about the man. The city's architecture is one of the crowning glories. The most significant of its older building types is the Havali. These two century year old former mansions have been restored and repurposed as shops, boutique hotels and museums, giving life to the once abandoned building art. But you can't overlook the modern as well. The city is growing in both size and sophistication, giving it the full range of architectural wonders. When it comes to architecture, one of the best examples of late 15th century Hindu art is found on the walls of the Egypt step well. This five-story deep well with its tragic love story has kept the citizens of Ahmadabad's thirst quenched for centuries. Of course, no mention of Ahmadabad would be complete without textiles. The fabric of this city is tied up in cloth. Pun fully intended. I'm Bill Ball, and I'll see you on the next episode of Journeys in India.